All right, so we're going to talk about therapeutics involving the urinaries. And these are the things. I am going to go through on UTIs a little bit. This will be a revisiting of your uh, small animal drugs and bugs, but I think it's a common enough uh, infection that you treat that it's worthwhile going over. I'll also mention some of the nephrotoxic drugs, what they are, and uh, how we minimize the risk how we change urinary pH and when we want to, uh, inhibiting uric acid excretion, that's important in Dalmatians, <coughs> increasing renal blood flow, primarily in oliguric renal failure, uh, likewise diuresis, uh, some of that is for renal disease, it's uh, applicable to a lot of other diseases as well, we want to diurese patients. Alteration of urethral tone in terms of uh, urinary incontinence, the opposite where we induce micturition, uh, where we typically decrease tone and simultaneously try to get the bladder to contract. Now what is grayed out is adjustment of dosage in renal failure patients. Uh, <clears throat> I used to go through the equations on how you do this. Uh, it, it's not that involved in the sense that it involves um, going to the literature and finding out what fraction of a drug is excreted by the kidney uh, versus total excretion, and then adjusting it based on uh, creatinine, either adjusting it based on urinary creatinine clearance or serum creatinine, those two being the inverse. You'd be glad to know that I'm not going through that because it, you just don't do it commonly enough. Typically, if you have an animal in renal failure, and you're concerned about the drug being toxic and accumulating, you choose another drug. The, uh, the rare cases where we did this was primarily with aminoglycosides, and now you would use therapeutic drug monitoring if you had the rare instance where you would use one in a renal failure patient. So bottom line is that if you need to adjust a drug in renal failure, adjust the dose, give me a call, okay? Controlling infections. Uh, some things I want you to remember. Uh, they can be either gram positive or gram negative. Here are the most common isolates. Uh, e. coli is common in all of them. In small animals, you've got staph, in horses, you've got strep, in cattle, you've got uh, chronic bacteria. But you have to, if you don't know what you're dealing with, you have to address both gram positive and gram negative. You typically do not have to address obligate anaerobes, however. Those are very rare uh, etiologies in uh, UTIs. <coughs> uh, in practice, you may not culture every UTI, especially first time. Here, we tend to do that, and most urologists in veterinary medicine have gone that way. We routinely culture every UTI, okay, especially because of the resistance problems we're seeing. But you do have to start therapy while you're waiting, okay, for those cultural results to come back. And uh, by the way, relative to uh, therapy, the urine should be sterile within three days if the antibiotic is working. All right. And that's one of the things we do, especially on recurrent UTIs is we'll come in and we'll check them about a week. Now, again, really in three days they're sterile. A week is just an easy thing to remember. But we'll reculture them in a week to make sure the antibiotic is truly working, and then we'll reculture them afterwards uh, <coughs> to uh, avoid relapses. Now, how long do you treat? There is no good information out there. You think of such a common disease, somebody would do clinical trials to determine it, but no, they haven't. Okay, so uh, what you're seeing here is a, uh, the recommendations from a task force that looked at this, and these are actually shorter durations than we historically have used. Uh, right now, the recommendation is for a first time UTI, a week may be adequate of antibiotic therapy. If it's a recurrent UTI or any time you have a prostatitis, four to six weeks. I tend to go four weeks on the recurrent UTI and six weeks on the prostatitis. And same thing, anytime you have a pyelonephritis, four to six weeks of therapy, okay? 
uh, and I mentioned reculturing here, especially in recurrence and prostatitis and pyelonephritis. They're really prone to relapse, so you want to reculture uh, probably at least twice after antibiotic therapy. What do you use? Largely amoxicillin or clavamox. The guidelines actually say amoxicillin, uh, but you'll see a lot of clavamox used. Uh, <coughs> the second drug of choice, our first line, is TNS. All right. And it's ideal for UTIs, uh, great susceptibility, um, uh, great um, uh, concentration in the urine, those sorts of things. The reason it's not done as much as it once was is all these side effects, and you need to remember those. Okay, I'm going to reinforce things by making me memorize again. All right, so you need to know those side effects. But this is why we don't use more of it first line. We use a lot of uh, amoxicillin and clavamox first line, less TMS than we used to. Now, fluoroquinolone, we don't like to use routinely. The exception is the prostatitis. Okay and uh, pyelonephritis. There we'll go with the fluoroquinolone. Remember, recurrent UTIs, if you're getting the same organism each time they relapse, uh, <coughs> uh, look for uh, issues with owner compliance. They're not able to dose the animal. You're doing a TID dosing and they can only give it VID or they're skipping doses or maybe you uh, didn't uh, <coughs> dose long enough, but probably the most common problem are urolifts. I won't say it's impossible to sterilize a urolift with antibiotics, but it's pretty damn close. Uh, it's really hard uh, to sterilize a stone. You've either got to dissolve it, and the only one we can dissolve are struvite stones, or you've got to surgically remove it, and that's everything else. Now, if you're getting a different organism uh, when they relapse, then you need to look for underlying causes like anatomical abnormalities, vulvar inversion, uh, urine retention, these sorts of things, or uh, quite commonly immunosuppression. Uh, diabetes is a big one. Cancer uh, can do this. Realize if it's a cushion, uh, cushionoid animal, you can't rely on your UA to detect the cystitis because the cortisol in the Cushing's disease is going to suppress inflammation. So normally, in most animals, I do a UA to see if I need to do a culture. UAs are cheap, cultures are not. So I do a UA as a screening test, and then I culture on whether that's um, uh, abnormal. But in a cushionoid or in an otherwise immunosuppressed animal, animal chemotherapy for cancer, that sort of thing, you can't rely on your analysis. Uh, they won't have the proteinuria and the hematuria and the white cells that an animal would otherwise. Those you need to culture regardless, okay? Prostatitis, uh, the drug has to penetrate the blood prostate barrier. You do not have to do a biopsy of the prostate. You do not have to do a prostatic wash. We do those if we're concerned about prostatic cancer. All right. But uh, <coughs> if they have a prostatitis, they will have a cystitis. So you can get the etiology off your urine culture even though it's a prostate infection. And again, the fluoroquinolones, interfloxacin is typically our first line drug in a prostatitis in the dog. But if uh, it's resistant to that, then we'll consider chloramphenicol or TMS. Technically, the lincosamides and macrolides enter the prostate, but they're not used a lot uh, in prostatitis uh, or cystitis associated with prostatitis. These don't concentrate in the urine all that well. So normally, you'll be using those three. You will deal with some patients that basically the cystitis is so chronic. You've got microabscessation in the uh, bladder wall, it's thickened, it's fibrotic, and they just tend to relapse and relapse and relapse despite your best efforts. So there are a couple of things we do. 
One is to give one daily antibiotic therapy. Uh, this tends to be a single dose instead of a full course. Uh, a very common one is nitrocurrentoin, and normally when we treat a UTI to cure it, we will give that three to four times a day. But in this protocol, we'll give it once a day. Okay, so it's real common in these where you're, you're giving up on a cure, you're just trying to keep them in remission, to keep them comfortable. You'll give the nitrocurrentoin at bedtime, it's got a real short half-life, so it goes into the urine real rapidly, and then it sits there overnight in the bladder, uh, and then the dog gets up, goes outside, and it's gone when it urinates, but that's enough to keep it from being clinical. Now, I realize that uh, with time, resistance will develop, and you may have to switch. Typically, these are older dogs because of the chronic nature of the disease, so they oftentimes don't have long lifespans at the point you're doing this. So, it's not as big an issue as you might think simply because they typically die from other things uh, very commonly when you're in the stage of life where this is occurring. Now, again, another thing I like is methenamine. Uh, I'll talk to you later about methionine as a urinary uh, acidifier. That's different. This is methenamine. It is the prodrug that's converted to formaldehyde in an acid urine. Okay. Uh, so, uh, little resistance problems. Uh, the conversion is time dependent and it doesn't occur rapidly enough for you to treat a pyelonephritis. This is only for a cystitis. Um, use is all empiric, very little information in veterinary medicine. You don't see fungal UTIs all that commonly. Again, it's more the immunosuppressed animal or uh, repeated catheterization. Uh, for yeast infections, you can use fluconazole is most commonly what we'll use because it enters the urine. Uh, the uh, fungal UTI like renal aspergillosis is really hard to treat. Uh, Boriconazole, if they can afford it, would be your primary treatment there. It has the right spectrum, unlike fluconazole, for aspergillus, uh, and it's excreted in the urine. Only fluconazole and boriconazole go into the urine. Those are the only antifungals we use that go into the urine. Now, nystatin on yeast is effective as an infusion, but we try not to do that. It's really hard to uh, do the repeated catheterizations to infuse the bladder without carrying something in with your urinary catheter and causing, uh, contaminating the bladder and causing more problems. So that's kind of a last resort, more for um, um, mayors and that sort of thing where you can't afford the systemic antifungal.